Welcome back to The Breakfast. And of course, our next conversation this morning is on the negotiation with uh, bandits, uh, the kidnapped Kagara schoolboys, and of course, uh, other situations in the country where we've had to go back and forth with uh, rescuing Nigerian citizens who have been kidnapped. Uh, former head of state, Abdul Salami Abubakar, has made his statements clear with regards to um, negotiating with bandits. And a couple of days ago also, uh, General Ibrahim Babangida also um, put out um, his own views, saying it is not very wise to negotiate with bandits. This morning, we're joined by Chris Wukobia, is a convenient country first movement. Uh, to share his thoughts with us on this uh, very big issue. Good morning, sir. My Good morning. To be here. My Thanks for joining us. All right, so I'm, I'm going to, you know, just bring you in, first of all, on your thoughts on the idea of negotiating with bandits and looking at the peculiarities of our situation here in Nigeria. Um, across the world, you know, the United States and, you know, um, Western countries would say no negotiating with terrorists. You know, there's none of that conversation that will go on. But people will say, yeah, but they still do negotiate. So tell, tell us about our situation here in Nigeria. Let me start with that premise. Uh, America talks with the Taliban. America talks with uh, separatist groups. America talks with terrorists. For one soldier, they will discuss for three, six months. So uh, I think that that uh, misinformation, because you hear it every so often that, oh, you don't talk to terrorists, or you don't talk with terrorists. Uh, I think that... Um, that's a wrong call. Uh, Russia spoke with the Taliban for a long time and, and exited Afghanistan. You know, so I believe that what we should do is put issues in proper perspective. And the first thing to note is that if you were to ask me, were you to be president, will you talk with bandits? I would say no. Will you talk with the Haramists that have been there for 13 years? I'll say yes. And I'll tell you reasons. But um, be that as it may, the, what we have on the news and regarding whether you have to dialogue or give amnesty to the, um, to the bandits is, uh, is rather reprehensible. And I align with the thoughts of the former heads of state uh, General Ibrahim Badamasi Babangida and indeed um, the chairman of the National Peace uh, Commission, uh, uh, the former president, the former head of state, uh, Absalam Abubakar. You can't talk, you can't negotiate with terrorists, you can't discuss with them. If you do, you open another vista of, uh, of um, if you like, the business of another vista that. Uh, that, that involves the business of kidnapping for ransom, that involves the business of banditry and tyranny and villainy. So I, I want to say clearly that discussing with the bandits, uh, like um, Sheikh Gumi has uh, opinionated, has, uh, has suggested, has opined, is wrong. Same in the Nigerian Governor's Forum. We shouldn't. We shouldn't. Uh, and I think that the Governor's Forum must interrogate those uh, normative and for three reasons first for how long are you going to negotiate or discuss with bandits if you do so in the northwest will banditry not shift to the northeast will it not shift to the north central will it not come to southwest because it's become business will it not go to the south south or the southeast so i i think simply uh, we must settle that fact this government, indeed, and indeed our country, should not dialogue, should not negotiate, should not discuss with bandits. Uh, what we must do is uh, give them an option of repentance, if you like. And what do I mean? Um, open their Marjorie schools. We have about 157. Give them option of uh, penance, repentance, or rehabilitation, or debriefing. And then um, if they don't, then take them out like America and every other country will do. You don't, you don't allow bandits hold you by the jugular. Okay, but to speak with them and give them these options, that's, that's dialogue already. Lots of people argue that. No, people are talking, the state governments are talking at that level. When you make it a national party, that's where we have a problem. Uh, that means that uh, the young man in Obinze 
who feels aggrieved can take up arms and then call himself a bandit and he's called by the government okay, to Mr. discuss. Walker, yeah. um, Retired General Abdul Salami Abubakar agrees with you. His statements yesterday uh, says, and I quote, dialogue is not the best way as it will embolden and encourage them to do more, knowing that you will always enter into dialogue with him. But in a situation where the bandits are now saying the Kagara boys will starve to death, and that they will begin to drop the bodies of the Kagara boys on the streets. Are you saying dialogue shouldn't be considered in this case? Let me say this. The, where we are as a nation is such that we must interrogate what happens surgically. And I say this deeply and advisedly. If every individual threatens the state, then we're in trouble. What's the strongest entity in every space? It's government. What's the most powerful structure and power in every system? It's government. Or oh, it should be government. It's government. It's still government. Even the weakest of governments can muscle the strongest of tyrants. That's why Somalia hasn't gone under. As strong as our Shabab, as, as equipped, as funded as our Shabab, it hasn't taken over government. That's how powerful and amorphous, if you like, government can be. So when we allow ragtag villains, bandits, to hold the government by the jugular, I disagree. What we must do, now that it's clearly obvious that we know where these bandits are, now that it's clearly obvious that we know where the Kagara boys are, give them options. They don't want to die too. You know, I, 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 I watched a film when I was growing up, you know, who wants to die? Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. That was a uh, school face or something, and mark for that. And I said clearly that in the game of power, even the saddest terrorist wants life. You remember when, uh, was it May 2nd or so, when the American Marines, the SEALs, yes. um, invaded <laughs> Afghanistan to get Osama Bin Laden? Mm -hmm. Let's say the moment he sighted them, he pulled his hands up and he wanted to, to, to talk. Everybody loves life. So I, I think that the time has come for us to engage. If Sheikh Gumi has access to them, he should tell them that government is not willing to do this and this. But you have to, for your own safety, do this. So, and then that begins to, perhaps because they also want to leave, they will release the boys like they did the Kugara boys. So, so, I, so I want to ask, you know, once again about the peculiarities of our situation. Um, seeing, you know, the efforts that government has put in, the military efforts that, that we've put in um, over time, um, and seeing the level of success that we've, we've been able to achieve. Seeing also um, the details with regards to our failures in security with our borders, with, you know, checkmating, funds transferred to band. It's just so many angles in where, you know, people, people might argue that we've not done well enough. Would you say our hands are tied and so we are somehow forced, you know, to get into negotiation with bandits? And also, what is your, uh, what would you also, you know, say to people like Sheikh Gumi um, and other northern elders who are advocating for negotiation? Let me say clearly that uh, with respect to Sheikh Gumi, he's driven by passion, passion for peace, passion for uh, if you like, the re rehabilitation of the boys that uh, he cares about is driven by love for his people, and that's understandable. I won't lampoon that. I won't crit criticize that. But you know what? Um, trying to, abundantly or inadvertently, um, draw a line between what is happening in the Northwest and what happened in the South-South a la the militancy of the South South yes. and the amnesty is where I totally disagree with him. Um, when Yadu of blessed memory tinkered with amnesty for militants, it was obvious that that was the way to go. They had held the oil sector almost to the near. And don't forget that Nigeria needs, uh, survives on primarily, primarily and principally on oil. And so, if he hadn't negotiated with the militants whose right to their resources they were campaigning, then Nigeria perhaps would have gone under. So, that dialogue was necessary. 
and that uh, amnesty, if you like, could have been declared plausible. Our, right. our, our hands tied. But, yeah, now, but now, similarly, no, our hands are not tied. Now, clearly, the armed forces and indeed the police can deal with the situation if they want to, and that's the caveat. And I, I hope that the new service chiefs would want to. Mark my use of words. I hope that committedly they will think about it. And I hope that the primacy of lives and properties will matter. Because, hey, you have insurgency, um, what the world calls terrorism in the Northeast. And now you have banditry and cattle rustling in kidnap for ransom in the Northwest. And then you have Heda Pharma crisis and conflicts in the North Central. Now you have ethnic conflict in perhaps, if you like, conflagration in the, north, in the Southwest. You have the IPOB and the separatist agitation in the Southeast. And then you have South-South where new tendencies of uh, resource control advocates are emerging. And so our country is in trouble. What we must do is for government to sit up, address these issues frontally and fundamentally. And the way first is to look at a nation, how we make our nation more equitable, how we raise the frontiers of social justice, how we remove this air that hangs over this country where some think that they're more equal than the others, like George Orwell's yeah. novel, oh, The Animal oh. Farm, where um, our dear brothers who are Fulanese understand that Everyone who's in Nigeria, Biwi, Joy, Ibo, Fulani, Aousa, we're all tied together by and with a single network of mutuality and that there is none that is superior to the other. Until this government and indeed our leadership shows that line of thinking and thought, this, um, if you like, this air of uncertainties, Conflict and conflagrations will continue. Mr. Wokovia, talking about uncertainties, do you think the government has been honest with Nigerians enough about her security situation? And I ask this because of the contradictory information we've been getting about the government's stance on payment of ransom or not. Lai Mohammed has repeatedly said the government doesn't pay ransom, even though we always get information that contradicts that. Like this story on the punch, Bandits say they rejected a 2.7 million naira ransom that the government offered them and instead won the release of six of their colleagues and they demanded that Niger vigilantes be disbanded. If the government had been forthright, if the government had been sincere, if the government had been true to the Nigerian people regarding the happenings, uh, Allah, if you like, exchange of money for kidnap uh, individuals? The answer is no. You and I know. The heavens know. The earth knows. Even the devil cannot deny that truism. That uh, we have even had, he didn't deny it, a certain governor in the Northwest who said that he had given monies to bandits to stop the conflict. So why does the government keep denying now, that? Now, lying. I think that sadly this administration has lifted um, perfidy and mendacity to a state act. It does appear like, oh, saying we're sorry we did this is demonic, and lying about what they did is saintly. And I think that the time has come for us to tell our dear government. Um, you have seen where even the British Prime Minister come up to, to his people to say, I'm sorry about this information. Uh, this, we found out a week later that this was a true picture. That's what leadership should be. Uh, like Caesar's wife, leaders should come up above board. But sadly, you know, this is a country where even negative op opinion, when I criticize government, I'm deemed an enemy of state. When I sing the praise of government, I'm seen as a friend of state. But that's the wrong thing. I, I want to say, and clearly so, that those who criticize government are actually friends of government, because they want government to do well. Um, leadership 101, that's what I call it. Abraham Lincoln and Stanton. Stanton was the greatest critic Abraham Lincoln had in human history. 
Stanton called him all kinds of names, went personal, yes. said that Lincoln was the ugliest man he'd ever seen. He had the neck of a hawk, the face of a vulture. There was nothing he didn't call Lincoln. But when Lincoln became president of America, do you know who he appointed the secretary, private secretary of war? It was Stanton. You know why? When he was asked by his colleagues, why Stanton? He said, because Stanton is the only one who can look me in the face and tell me what he thinks about me and who I am. And that's the only way I can do right, because I know that with me is someone who can tell me what it is and just the way it is. Right. Unfortunately, leadership in this country sees those who are forthright and straight as enemies. And that's a tragedy of the Nigerian nation. We see critical opinion as hate. We see those who disagree as willers. We see those who do not think that certain things are being done correctly as haters, as enemies of state. And that's very reprehensible. That is perhaps what underlines the, 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 the perfidy, the deceit, the mendacity, if you like, of state operators. All okay, right. can, we, can we explore in detail other military strategies to rescue abducted students and to prevent a recurrence away from negotiation and dialogue, if, if that's what you say we you shouldn't know, do right now? You know, every so often I get confronted with questions about um, kidnap suspects and kidnap victims. I get very emotional. I am the victim, deep victim, of this malaise. I lost my immediate younger sister about four years ago to kidnap us. So, I'm sorry about so that. I know what it is. And when I think about young boys who should be in school, kidnapped and taken into hostel, into, uh, as hostage, I bleed. When I think about young women who are taken hostage and who are kidnapped in some violated in captivity, I weep. When I think about a country, I'm in my late 40s, when I think about a country that has relative peace in the 80s, a country where if you say, let me use the regular parlance, somebody won't kill himself, then we'll say, ah, I better leave that story. And today, suicide, suicide bombing, it become a regular tale in our national uh, story. It bothers me. And deeply, I think, is a failure of state operators, the APC leaders, as well as the PDP leaders. And those who politic with it, are those who bother me more. Because um, we, we saw the emergence. Boko Haram started under the PDP. Unfortunately, it appears to have gone stronger and more energized under the present watch. So they're both guilty. What we must do is begin to think about how to solve a problem. And actually, that's my passion. How do we make sure that when our children go to school, we're sure they're safe? How do we make sure that when our mothers and our sisters travel to the market, they will return home. How do we make sure that Nigeria is largely safe? And I think that uh, on that score, I'll make five suggestions. In the short run, we must get back what you call a national script, a national message. That is where the National Orientation Agency must come alive preach about the primacy of lives. That one blood spilled calls for more blood. Offense God, because we're largely Christians and Muslims. Offense the Almighty Allah. Preach about it. Preach about the green, white, green. Preach about that beautiful country that we had in the 60s, if you like, before the Civil War. And then that some of us grew up in. Because I, I don't have an enemy in a Yoruba or a Oso guy. They're my best friends. And I think that same applies to you. And let's preach about our strength in our diversity. That's the challenge to the anyway. Right, then the second one, please let me just right. put out the, 
The second one is we must raise a national flag. Um, if you like the red flag, not even a national flag, on matters that concerns education. You know what? Every so often you talk about education, people don't understand how, how far it goes. You won't go into the forest kidnapping people. You won't do that, no matter how hungry you are. 90% of those who are in the forest kidnapping people do not have education. You saw their dialogue with Sheikh Kumi, that the state abandoned them. They are not educated. They don't know what to do with life, but banditry and villainy. So why not just bring to life the 156 or 157 Amajuri schools in the north and get these boys into school? Why not raise issues about the need to get our boys and our girls educated? And that can be done quickly. Funding can come in the midterm. Then the th third point is we must have a national dialogue that will talk with select tendencies, the civil society, the political leadership, about how to foster uh, unity. But that will be predicated on, if you like, what we are talking about, restructuring, an overhaul of our constitution to allow for justice, equity, and fairness. The fourth one, which is very important, rearm and equip the armed forces. Pay them well and ensure that their morale is strong and high enough to deal with the conflicts of state. And then number five, get a situation where the governors across the country are able to synergize at the level of state vigilante groups dealing and understanding security logistics with the federal structure such that if a kidnapper or a bandit leaves Nasrallah state, for instance, and is heading to uh, Kogi state or any other state, there's a synergy of information. And this can be done without all this politics and politics everywhere. All right, right. I, Mr. I want to go into a little, you know, um, before we go, um, something that's you know, a little controversial. You're from the Southeast. Um, I'm from the South South. South South, okay, I beg your pardon. Um, how would you um, address those who say, um, who deserves to be called a terrorist group and who deserves to be negotiated with? Um, and of course, you know I'm referring to the IPOB now and you know the difference between the way that they have been addressed and the way that bandits, in quote, have been addressed. I've said clearly, and I'll repeat it for the opportune time, I'm not a fan of the politics and the politics and perhaps the agitations of Nanda Kano. But I'll say before the world that separatism is not terrorism. If it were terrorism, Spain would have called Catalonia. The Catalonia and the leaders of the demands and the call for Catalon, Catalonia as a state terrorist. The United Nations Charter understands the agitation for statehood and they have recognized that as a valid right. All over the world, um, I, have, I should have the right to say I don't want to be with you. And you can't kill me or brand me for saying that. What you should do, rather, is address the reasons why I don't want to be with you. And so that's why I totally disagree with uh, the present government regarding that issue. But is Nam the Kano doing right? Preaching hate? He's called my people of the South South sellouts. And I remember, I wasn't born during the war. But I remember that my dad lost his dad and mom during the war. I also remember that my mom lost her dad during the war. So one family lost three parents during the war. The Midwest, and indeed, I'm from Ibuza. We lost so many people. And then we led the Biafra militia. So now the Kanu cannot give me a lecture on commitment to the Biafran cause. Yeah. The but truth they... is that he's far more emotive than logical in his call. But I, I, I want to say clearly that if I were president, I will negotiate. I will discuss with Biafra and reassure them that within the Nigerian estate, they can get some sense of inclusion, justice, equity, 
in oneness. Yeah, and it, then it, let it, me it, say this clearly yeah. before, because I, I don't know how much time we have. Well, we're out of time, actually. That there is something we must note about our country, and it's very important. There's a state in this country that has nine borders. Nine borders. That state is today the safest state in the north, the entire north. That state today is the second safest state in the whole of Nigeria after Oshu State. You can Google it. That state is Kogi. Ask yourself what the young man who is the governor of Kogi State has done to ensure that the state is safe. And then those who should pretend this country should take a cue. Important. He has been able to reach out to different tendencies. And are you aware that Kogi is multi-ethnic, multi-religious? He's the first governor since the creation of Kogi State to build a chapel All right. in the government house. No, I, I know right. why I'm saying this. Uh, it might sound like a PR job, but the truth is that if we must move this country forward, we must sit together at the table of dialogue, identify the tendencies that trouble us, and see how effectively we can address the fundamentals and, right. and, and create peace for our nation. Mr. Chris Wonkovia is a convener, uh, Country First Movement. Fantastic um, uh, conversation we've had this morning. And of course, always looking forward to speaking with you again. Yes, thank you very much for all the important points that you've, you've given us on The Breakfast this morning. We do hope government is listening and can take you know, solutions out of this that we can implement for the greater good. We'll take a break now to continue talks about security intertwining with politics here on The Breakfast.